I'm John Hanna for CDTV.net and we have Peter Dickey, the CEO and President of Quantum Rare Earth. Thanks for joining us, sir. Thanks very much for having me. No, sir, uh, you came in from where? I came in from Vancouver, BC, over on the uh, warmer west coast. Up north, thank you for uh, dropping by in our Wall Street office here. Thank you, sir. Now, let's talk about your, your, your company first. Uh, tell us a little bit again the, uh, what Quantum Rare Earth is all about. Basically, we have two uh, primary projects. Our, our premier project is the Elk Creek Carbonatite, which is located about an hour south of Lincoln, Nebraska. It's a uh, large uh, geological anomaly there that was previously worked on by Molly Corp in the 1970s and 80s. And they did an extensive amount of drilling on it, which we've been the uh, beneficiary of being able to retrieve that data and the core and uh, reassay, reanalyze it, and bring it up to modern reporting standards. How were you able to get into the, the, to, the, uh, to that piece of land, to that piece of property, and um, uh, where do you go from here? Well, the, the uh, original... The, the piece of property itself is a, it's a substantial piece. It's about 10,000 acres. Uh, it's actually private land. Uh, there's about 40 or 50 different individual farmers own the, own the land, and uh, they all own their mineral rights. So we were in a position where we, uh, a, uh, a company was put together to acquire those mineral rights. A, uh, it's a prepaid lease, uh, the same terms that Molly, Molly Corp had back in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, albeit the prices are back in 2011 terms, but uh, at the end of the uh, prepaid lease there is a, uh, a pre-negotiated buyout figure where we can acquire uh, uh, on a permanent basis the mineral rights to uh, all of this land. Okay, so everything has been uh, uh, predetermined already, pre-priced and all that stuff, and this was back in the 80s you said, right? Let's talk about the recent press release about the findings at the uh, mine now in uh, in where's this again? It's in Elk Creek, Nebraska. Nebraska. There you go. <laughs> okay. Um, you're pretty happy about that finding. I need to get some more information about it. Sure. We're we're ex we're actually very very pleased with the results. Um, back in uh, back in the 70s and 80s, as I mentioned, when Molly Corp worked on this project extensively, uh, they actually came up with a resource calculation of 39 million tons of 0.82 percent niobium, which is uh, would be considered a a, a very high grade. Uh, source of potential source and a, and a substantial tonnage of niobium. Now of course that was in the, the mid 1980s and reporting standards are somewhat different nowadays and of course uh, you know we would like to be able to report a a modern resource figure uh, to essentially take it to the bank so to speak uh, in order to finance startup of a mine there. Okay. What we've done is we've uh, reassayed a lot of their core um, the, we've reanalyzed a lot of the data that, they, that accompanied the core, and uh, the results uh, somewhat speak for themselves. Okay, so let's define what is a 0.8% grade, uh, what is the competition has, and what is the current rate for the, uh, uh, the product uh, before and after, you know, after the cost has been calculated and all that stuff. So we wanted to get a, a sense of what are we talking about in dollar-wise here. Sure, in dollars, um, essentially, there, there's, there's essentially three mines in the world that produce niobium as a primary product. Um, two of them are in Brazil. They are privately held. The, only, the third mine is owned by I Am Gold, and it's located in Quebec, province of Quebec, and it's called the Niobec Mine. Uh, they inherited that mine when they took over Cambior Gold uh, about uh, eight or ten years ago. Now that, being in a public company, those figures are reported, so we can analyze those figures somewhat. And, um, well, I'll put it this way, in their last uh, annual financial statements released less than uh, two months ago, uh, they were reporting an operating grade of 0.58% niobium, so a lower grade, and at the same time, they were operate, they were uh, announcing a uh, operating profit of almost twenty dollars per kilogram produced. And wh what is the, I'm sorry to jump in, but what is the cost to produce that? Um the, their their cost to produce at the moment, they've been in production for about twenty years now. That mine, but their cost to produce is in the uh, neighborhood of uh, twelve to fifteen dollars per kilogram. Right, so twelve to fifteen U.S. dollars per kilogram. 
as a, and being sold in the market at what price now? Uh, they're, they're selling their product into the market at uh, approximately 32 to $35 per kilogram. Okay. Now, um, with your operation, once, when do you think uh, you guys are going to break ground and actually start digging and you know, excavating the, uh, the uh, rare earth material right there now? That's an excellent question. <laughs> Thank you. The sooner the better. <laughs> we try hard here. So. <laughs> <laughs> the sooner the better. No, we, um, uh, uh, as I, I may have mentioned earlier, we're having an engineering firm is completing a brand new resource calculation for us to modern reporting standards. That report is expected at the, uh, either in the last week of February or first week of March this year. Uh, that report will be very telling as far as what our next step of work is concerned. We, we know that we will be starting a drilling program on the property within the next 30 days. Uh, where exactly we drill uh, is partially going to be dependent on, upon that report. If, there's, if the report states that there's enough material in the measured and indicated category of the resource, then we may uh, do some infill drilling and at the same time uh, start work towards a um, preliminary economic uh, report on, on the deposit, preliminary feasibility study on the deposit. Um, the timing of that, of course, uh, you know, is up to the authors of the deposit, but uh, once that's complete and assuming it goes forward positively as everything has so far for us, uh, then we would, we would look to do a, uh, what they refer to as a bankable feasible study, uh, which would give an exact timeline as to when we might start production. What is the timeline are we talking about here? Like three to six months, six months to a year, two years? Uh, in, in as far as a startup of production, if everything goes smoothly, if all the reports come in as as uh, we hope they will, um, you know, we would realistically be looking at a two or three year absolute minimum timeline. Um, and uh, in in uh, all likelihood, it could be as long as four or five years. But yep. and it, Accompanying those, of course, there's environmental assessment work that has to be done and environmental impact studies that have to be done. So uh, there, there's lots of work ahead. Okay. Now, um, with regards to, I'm sorry, I, I, you, you got to remind me. How do I pronounce this uh, 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 element? Ni niobium. Niobium. Okay. I'm thinking, where do I use it? Is it is it people use it on a daily basis? I mean, where do you where do you uh, who do you sell to? Well, you're completely forgiven for not remembering how to pronounce it because a lot of people I talk to about it sometimes I have to spell it for them. Oh. It's not a commonly heard of material. Uh, Ninety percent of it used worldwide goes into high strength steel, and uh, what they refer to as HSLA street steel or high strength low alloy steel. And quite frankly, there are two main competitors in that market, and that's vanadium and molybdenum. Okay. Um, however, niobium, we know, produces a finer grain steel, and so in a number of applications, it's quite unique and cannot be replaced. Mm. So the balance of the use worldwide goes into super alloys, and those are used in, in a wide range of industries, such as the aeronautical industry, um, Jet thrusters on engines require a lot of mil uh, niobium. Uh, an MRI machine requires a lot of niobium. Okay, so I didn't know about a, that. A broad scope of use of the product. How big is the market out there for this particular product? Well, the market uh, at the moment is, is in the range of about 80,000 tons per year, 70 to 80,000 tons per year. It's been growing on average by roughly 10% or slightly more every year. And um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, the, the largest usage of it is in high strength steels and that would be in construction, that would be in the automotive industry, that would be in the pipeline industry. And those industries are all on the road to recovery or starting to recover from, from the economic situation of late 2008. How much does China need niobium and is this something that we need here in the U.S.? It's, it's definitely something that China needs. It's also definitely something that's used in the U.S. right now. Um, the, probably the best figure that I could give you on, on, on Chinese consumption is that worldwide the, the, figure, uh, the amount of niobium that goes into a ton of steel to, to be used as a hardener is about two and a half times the equivalent amount of niobium that is used in China right now. So if China were to even just increase their 
usage of niobium per ton of steel, it would dramatically increase the overall size of the market. Now, back to your question about the U.S., the U.S. imports 100% of their niobium right now. It comes, the majority of it comes from Brazil, but uh, a portion of it also comes from Quebec. And uh, this is one of the highlights of our project that we really feel confident about in that uh, conceivably we have a, a single source of niobium that could produce a substantial portion of the U.S. import needs. And the U.S. import needs right now are in the range of eight to 10,000 tons per year. Okay. Um, there's been a lot of uh, mergers and acquisition right now because there's a lot of companies uh, has a lot of money in their coffers, as they say. So let's say, for example, when somebody comes in and says, you know what, uh, we're not going to wait until you do your final testing. We're going to buy you now at a cheaper rate or something like that, or whatever the evaluations that they come up with, would you be selling the company? <laughs> We've... Um, uh, we would never shut the door to anybody at this point in time as far as uh, discussing that aspect of the business. We are not openly pursuing um, suitors at this point in time though. Uh, we feel that there is substantial value in the project that is yet to be realized by our shareholders. Um, you know, we're, we're um, uh, potentially sitting on hundreds of millions of pounds of niobium, which, um, you know, given a, a, a gross evaluation is in the billions of dollars. Um, our market cap is, is uh, you know, certainly well under a hundred million dollars right now. And for somebody to, uh, a larger company to come along and acquire us at this point in time uh, would be a heck of a deal for them. Yeah, but still, it's, it's still, uh, I'm going to look at it, you know, I'm, I'm going to be on the other side of the coin now. We, yeah. You toss that into the hat now, uh, but they still don't know whether or not that's confirmed, you know, that's, that's the thing. That's it's, correct. Right. That's correct. Anybody coming into the scene right now are subject to the same limitations that we are as far as... Limitations you know, and risk yeah, and, you know... Yeah, like, risk. And uh, so, so they would be absorbing some of that risk, obviously, mm -hmm. um, and they would obviously want to price that into any acquisition. Right, the evaluation cost. method that That's they right. have. That's no. right. So we'd like to, you know, take the, take the risk out of th that process, and then if somebody comes along, then we'll talk to them. Okay. Now, with regards to what you know with, with uh, uh, cash flow? Cash, we, uh, we just raised about $6.5 million uh, four months ago. Uh, that was done primarily in Toronto. It went uh, approximately 90% of that went to um, uh, institutional investors. Um, so, and they're all long-term believers in the project. Uh, we've, you know, received a, a certainly it was a, a vote of confidence uh, to us at the time. As a matter of fact, we um, we originally only intended to raise three million dollars, and um, we wound up raising more than double that um, just because of the demand. Now, um, full disclosure, are you buying or selling your shares, your stocks within one year to two years? All I've done is buy stocks. <laughs> okay, so that's how you believe so much about the... Of course, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, if anybody's ever concerned about that, we certainly have full disclosure rules on the uh, Canadian marketplace, and, and uh, I have to report every single trade I make. Awesome. And uh, if they, you know, ever care to view those, uh, they can see how all I've ever done is acquire shares. So That's Peter Dickey. President and CEO of Quantum Rare Earth, joining us here at Wall Street, and I'm Jan Hanna for CDTV.net. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.